Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Steve Thomas, and I'm a professor here at Smith, and I'm also the director of our MMA and MMAI programs. And today is my pleasure to talk to you guys about chatbots. So chatbots are a fascinating technology that's actually been around for a while, but given some recent improvements in how they work and the availability of training data, uh, they're starting to be used more and more in business. So we're going to kind of uncover how they work, um, how they're used, um, and some of these issues. So I'm planning to, to talk and give an overview for about 30, 40 minutes, and there'll be some time at the end for any questions you may have about anything at all. So as you have a question, feel free to just send it along and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so many of you are probably familiar with chatbots through pop culture and movies. Uh, there's a famous chatbot named Hal from the classic movie 2001 Space Odyssey. And Hal, well, you know, the story of Hal, if you're unfamiliar, is it started off as a really useful, helpful bot, but towards the end it kind of developed its own agenda and ended up turning a little bit evil. And more recently in the TV show Black Mirror, there's an episode called Be Right Back. And this is, was an interesting episode. So a girl uh, lost her boyfriend, he died, uh, but given the technology available, they kind of recreated her boyfriend as a chatbot on her phone. So this episode explores how a human can develop a relationship with a chatbot even, and as the chatbot becomes you know, more and more human-like. And another movie that's kind of similar to that is Her uh, with Joaquin Phoenix. So uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character was kind of a lonely guy, um, and he bought this chatbot and, that he could talk to whenever he wanted to. And the chatbot had a female voice, and her name was Samantha, and he ended up developing feelings for her. So lots of interesting stuff going on in, in pop culture on chatbots. But a lot of you probably have used chatbots yourself um, with virtual assistants that are available now, you know, like Apple Siri, Amazon's Alexa, Google Home. These are amazing products available now. Uh, I have a Google Home, and it works really well, actually. And it allows you to do things like play music, tell you the weather, and tell you some jokes. Uh, you, you can ask it some conversions, like how many teaspoons in a liter. Uh, you can ask it... Um, some directed questions like, who was the Prime Minister of Canada in 1980? You know, you can ask it for the news, weather, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of you have probably been using chatbots, whether you realize or not, when you're interacting with companies. Uh, you know, a lot of banks have chatbots now, and you can text message them questions and requests. Uh, same with uh, booking appointments at all kinds of, you know, hair salons or, or lawyers or anything like that, and even ordering food. Uh, we'll, we'll look at some more later. But Pizza Hut, for example, in the U.S. has a chatbot that you can order pizza from now. So lots of interesting um, use cases of chatbots. But let us define what a chatbot is. So according to Oxford, a chatbot is a program designed to simulate a conversation with a human, which makes sense. Uh, one of the books we use in the MMA and MMAI programs defines it a little bit more precisely as a program that participates in turn-taking conversation and whose aim is to in interpret input text and speech and to output appropriate, useful responses. So the key property for a chatbot is basically they communicate with users in natural language. And that language could be either text on a screen or speech you know, um, that you can hear. And this is very different than how you normally interact with a computer. Normally with a computer, you're clicking on buttons, dragging things around, using your mouse. Um, or, and, and the way you see information is you know, in a spreadsheet or on an image, on a web page. Uh, so a chatbot totally changes the interface. It's using natural language. It's what humans were, you know, that's the first interface we're taught as, as babies, 
is to speak and to hear and to listen. So that's kind of the novelty of the chatbot. And chatbots really are the pinnacle of natural language processing. So natural language processing is a subset of AI that's all about dealing with uh, language, how to understand language, how to generate language. And there's a lot of sub-problems in NLP, starting at the basic at the bottom of this period, things like tokenization, which is just separating words into individual words in a, from a sentence. And then part of speech tagging is figuring out whether a word is a noun or a verb or an adverb, and so on up the chain. And you need all of these sub-steps in order to, to build a successful chatbot. And so chatbots are, you know, they're, some people view them not only as the pinnacle of NLP, but the pinnacle of AI. You know, when a lot of people who aren't familiar with artificial intelligence think of AI, they think of robots talking to them. It's all about the interface and the interaction. The history of chatbots actually starts quite a while ago, back in the 1960s, is when researchers started to think about having a computer talk to a human with natural language. And back then, they developed the very first chatbot called Eliza. And Eliza was really stupid and pretty dumb and basic compared to the chatbots of today. But it was still a first step in the right direction. Eliza basically was built using a series of hand-coded rules by a human programmer. And basically, it acted like a very simple psychologist. So if the human said, I had a bad day, then Eliza would reply, you had a bad day? And that's it. It would just kind of repeat whatever you said back to you. But, you know, it, it fooled some people into thinking it was real, a real psychologist. And it, it kind of, you know, sparked the imagination of a whole generation of computer scientists. And, you know, fast forward down the history line, nowadays we have Siri, Google Now, Alexa, Microsoft Cortana, and so on. You know, it's hard to believe that Siri's been out for almost a decade now, uh, but in that time, a lot has changed as well. Here's a slide on the popularity growth of chatbots. So just some fun stats. Adults spend 23 hours a week in messaging services on average, U.S. adults. And that's five times longer than they do on voice calls. Each adult sends an average of 67 messages per day. And WhatsApp and Facebook alone carry 60 billion messages every single day. Some other interesting facts is that 90% of consumers prefer to message a business rather than to call that business. 64% of consumers want a real-time response to their questions 24-7. They don't care about hours, opening hours, and all that stuff. And because of this, you know, 80% of businesses say that they want chatbots in place by 2020. So very aggressive timeline. Also, by 2020, uh, one study said that the average person will have more conversations with a bot than, it, than they will with their spouse, which makes sense. I mean, you could be talking to a bot all day at work. And another estimate said that by 2022, companies will be saving $8 billion a year in the U.S. by deploying chatbots. And we'll talk about later exactly how that, how that works. So huge popularity growth, huge demand, huge interest in this area. So today in these slides, what I want to do is kind of give you a sense of how chatbots are working internally, and we'll, we'll walk through what it takes to build a chatbot and what are kind of the design decisions you have to make. We'll talk about some of the tools and frameworks that are available to help you build chatbots, and then we'll talk about the benefits and the drawbacks and the challenges involved. Okay, so how do chatbots work? Well, basically, there's two kinds of chatbots. Uh, the word chatbot is kind of ambiguous. There's something called a conversational agent and something called a task-oriented agent. Conversational agents, these, these are chatbots that are designed to have long, open-ended conversations about anything at all. You know, kind of like going on a first date. You know, anything's game. Questions like, do you believe in God? Or what's your favorite color? Or what do you want to do when you grow up? Now, uh, these are more... The, the purpose of these chatbots are more for fun or for social settings, 
Um, these are a lot harder to build because the conversation could be about literally anything, and the chatbot has to be much smarter to be able to hold an intelligent conversation about anything. On the other hand, there's something called task-oriented agents. These are chatbots built for a very specific business task, usually designed for very short, pointed conversations. Things like, I'd like to order a pizza, what's the weather right now in Kingston, you know, things like that. So this is what Siri is, and you know, the Pizza Hut bot that we talked about where you can order pizza. This is also a task-oriented agent. This is what businesses use. These are, luckily, these are easier to build because it's constrained what the bot could possibly hear and what the bot is supposed to be able to do. So that's what we're going to talk about today for the rest of the slides is, is the task-oriented agent. And conversational agents are very interesting in their own right, but today we'll focus on the task, task-oriented agents. So here's kind of a brief overview of how they work. So what happens at the beginning, if you start in the top left of this slide, is that a user will say something to the bot. And it could, this could be text or it could be speech, doesn't really matter. For example, they might say, I want some Mexican food near Smith, Toronto. In the chatbot world, this is called an utterance. The user utterance, or utters something and it's called an utterance. Anyway, that text goes into the chatbot, the chatbot system, which is this uh, you know, light blue box here. And the chatbot system has a few different subcomponents. The first component is called natural language understanding. And basically, this, this is a machine learning classifier that takes that text and tries to figure out what the user wants, what the user's intent is. So for example, the, in, in this example, the intent is to find a restaurant. So the output of the natural language understanding box will say, oh, I think this user wants to find a restaurant. And for find a restaurant, uh, it, it will pull out some of the details of what kind of restaurant, what's the cuisine, where the restaurant is, and other things like this. These are called entities. So each intent will have a number of entities, which are basically just details that the user wants or, or to help the bot answer the question. Um, so now that we have this structured data, so we've gone from unstructured utterance to a structured data. We know the intent and we know the entities that this user is looking for. Then the chatbot will go look up the answer in a series of databases. So in this case, uh, whoever built this chatbot has a database of restaurants. It might have some some rules, some business rules, like you know maybe Chipotle has would bid on answering this question or something like that, or whatever the business rules are. It also has some context about each user. It, it, it will remember that this user maybe is female, uh, remember uh, their social class or, or you know income levels or what their preferences are, where they've gone to in the past, so they can tailor the answer. So basically, they, they look up the database results, uh, find that restaurant in the entertainment district in Toronto with Mexican cuisine, and they come up with the answer. But rather than showing the answer as a database query result, it goes through one more pass, which is the natural language generation. This is a, another sub-tool that takes a piece of structured data, like Chipotle, and you know, makes it sound like a human would say it. So it'll turn this into an English sentence. And the response might be something like, how about Chipotle on 123 Front Street West? So that's called the response, and that's what the user sees. The user doesn't see all these other steps in the middle. It just asks, the user asks a question and it gets a response. So let's look at the natural language understanding uh, box a little bit more. Basically, to build this, what, what the data scientist team needs to do is first is they define all the possible intents that the user could ask for. Th this is basically you know, questions the user can ask that the bot will be able to perform. So for example, the bot may uh, be able to find restaurants, book flights, reset passwords, show weather, 
whatever it is. It depends on what business problem you're trying to solve. Normally, when you when you name an intent, you give it a verb and then a noun. And there's no space between them. This is just kind of how we do it in the chatbot world. But in, anyway, you define all the d intents, and then you have to define what's called a frame for each intent. And a, a frame are these little tables at the bottom. Um, I'm showing two example frames, one for the book flight intent and one for the show weather intent. And a frame just holds all the entities, all the details that we need to know in order to do something. So for example, for the book flight intent, you know, if a user wants to book a flight, what do you need to know before you can book the flight? Well, you need to know where they're coming from, where they're going, what time they want to leave, and what time they want to depart. And you probably want to know a few other things, but I'm simplifying it a little bit. Or if the user wants you to show the weather, well, you need, what do you need to know? You need to know the city and probably the time, maybe a couple other things, but this is probably good enough. So each of these, basically, if you list out all the things you need to know, that's called the frame for the intent. And the cool thing about the natural language understander um, is it will keep asking questions to the user until it gets a value for all of the entities. Because it needs a value in order to answer the question. So if it doesn't have the value, for example, if it doesn't know where you're flying from, it's going to ask, where are you flying from? And you, the data scientist, can actually define how these questions sound and how they flow together. There's an example in the next slide. Uh, but basically, you keep asking all these questions, and once all the values are filled, the agent performs the appropriate action. It goes on to the next step. Here's an example of um, the book flight intent question flow. So if the, if the user says, I want to book a, a flight, it doesn't tell you anything else. Well, the bot will say, what city are you leaving from? Because it needs, to, it needs to fill in that entity value. And then it will ask, where are you going? What date do you want to leave? And is it a one-way trip? And depending on if the, if the user says yes or no, it will ask a different question. And basically, you, so you can define these questions to help get all the answers for all of the entities that you, that you have in your frame. Now, how does the natural language understanding uh, box actually classify an utterance? How does it know what the user is trying to do? Well, basically, it uses a machine learning classifier. And th this classifier will, will automatically tell you what the intent is and what the entity values are. Now, this uh, classifier can range anything from manually created rules by human to shallow machine learning models, and if, you, if you're an alum of our MMA or MMAI programs, you'll, you'll know what this means. But these are things like naive bays, logistic regression, support vector machine, uh, ensemble of these things, maximum entr tr entropy, Markov models, all kinds of stuff. Or, you know, lately in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of work on applying deep machine learning models, like uh, recurrent neural networks or long short-term memory or you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, no matter what the algorithm is, it's trying to do the same thing. It takes as input this utterance, which are just a series of words. It will do the magic under the hood, and then it will tell you which intent it thinks the user is asking for. So in this case, if the utterance is, show me yesterday's financial news, the, a, a well-working classifier will say, hey, the intent here is show news. The date is yesterday, and the section of the news they're interested in is financial. Uh, for another utterance, like, what's the weather in Kingston today, hopefully the classifier will say, okay, the intent was show weather, and the city is Kingston, and the time is today. Now, Every machine learning classifier needs training data to learn. Uh, you, basically, you, the human, have to tell the classifier uh, what uh, what the intent was for a bunch of training utterances. So humans manually build this training data and give it to the algorithms to learn. 
Uh, this is kind of a painstaking process, but it's a necessary step if you want your classifier to, look, to, to work well. So for example, you, the human, might come up with an example sentence or utterance. I want to fly from Boston at 8.38 a.m. and arrive in Denver at 11.10 in the morning. Basically, what you have to do is label that data. You have to split out every single word and then tell the classifier what to do with that word if it, if it were to see it again. So in this case, I want to fly from, we're giving it the label zero, which means don't worry about those words. But Boston, Boston's an important word. So we give that a special label. We say that's the from city name. At, meaning this word, 838, we're saying, hey, that's an important word. That's the depart time. And AM, also part of the depart time. And so on. So you, you go through each word and you say, these are the important bits. Learn what these important bits look like. And the classifier, you know, using a bunch of methods that we won't go into here, will start to learn you know, that Boston is a city name, 8.38 a.m. is the depart time, things like that. And, you might do, and you'll do this again. You do this for another uh, example utterance, like what flights are available from Pittsburgh to Baltimore on Thursday morning. Again, a human sits down, separates these words, and provides a label for each word. And you have to do this hundreds or thousands or even millions of times before your classifier is going to learn to handle arbitrary utterances. Um, it, so it, it's an expensive and painful task, but the more you do it, the better, better accuracy you'll get. And the good news is there's a lot of training data already available online that you can download and leverage, so you don't have to start from scratch a lot of the time but you do need training data one way or another. So let's talk about some of the tools. So there's a lot of tools available in this space, luckily, to make our jobs easier. Um, all four of the big cloud providers have a specific chatbot service. Amazon, Google, Azure, and IBM, they all have really good offerings in this space. There's a bunch of startups and independent companies that are also making really good products. Uh, for example, Raza and Botkit work really well and make it very easy to get up, up and running. But if you want to do it from scratch yourself, there's some Python packages and frameworks like Chatterbot, PyMessenger. This gives you more control over how everything works, but they're also a lot harder to build. The interesting thing about um, going with one of the cloud providers is you inherit a whole ecosystem of tools. For example, Google if you went with Google, Google has um, their messenger service, Allo. They have their Google Cloud platform in the background. And you can ship it all up on, uh, and package it all up for the Google Now interface. So you kind of get all that for free. And same with Amazon, same with Microsoft. So if you choose one of the clouds, you kind of get a lot of uh, bang for your buck. All right, let's talk a little bit about how to design one of these task-oriented agents. Basically, if, if you're a product, product manager or data science lead, and your goal is to build a chatbot, these are the steps you'll have to go through. You have to decide what it's going to do, how you're going to deliver it, how it's going to integrate with the rest of your company, what tools you're going to use. You're going to have to build those intents in the frames. You're going to have to continuously improve them. So let's look into each one of these. So the first thing you need to do is decide what it will do. What is your chatbot going to do? What user problems will you be solving? You know, are you going to allow them to book appointments? Are you going to allow them to check their balances? Are you going to allow them to move money? Are you going to allow them to create new credit card accounts? What do you want to try to do? And basically, what to help you figure this out, you want to look at what current opportunities do you have for your users today? Or in other words, what can you automate? What are questions that, or tasks that your customers or your users come, with, come to you all the time that are kind of easy to automate, easy to have a chatbot, chatbot do, and would provide high value? Another thing you, you might want to ask is, you know, are your users ready to use a bot for this task? And this kind of depends on who your the demographics of your customers, how technologically savvy they are, how sensitive they are to using new technology. 
you know, will they understand that they aren't talking to a person? Does it matter if they understand that or not? Or, or will they trust using the chatbot or the channel that they're using the chatbot on? So sometimes yes, sometimes no. So these are things you have to um, uh, think about. Then you have to think about how are you going to deliver the chatbot. And there's a lot of channels that you could do it on. You could build your chatbot and put it on your on your website or on your mobile app, which is kind of proprietary. Or you could deliver it on Google Home or Amazon Echo or one of these virtual assistants. Uh, Slack, if your team or your users use Slack, you can uh, deploy your chatbot on, on Slack or Twitter or even on SMS, which, um, text messaging. So you decide which of these or all of these, which ones you want to do. You also want to think, what languages do you need to support? Is it just English, English and French, English and Spanish? Um, you know, this just depends on what your customers are speaking and how much training data you have available in these languages. Yeah, uh, another thing I wanted to note about when you're choosing providers, um, if you go, if you go with one of the big four clouds. Um, I, most most of the big four clouds are kind of pulling away from the pack, so to speak. And by that I mean, you know, as more and more people are deploying chatbots on Amazon, Amazon is getting more and more training data, and therefore their chatbots are getting better and better. So you may want so, so there is some advantage to going with some of these bigger players because they have more chatbots. I mean, they have yeah, they have more users more training data. In fact, some people have uh, theorized in the blogosphere that the only reason Amazon and Google have chatbots um, in your home is to gather a lot of training data to make their models better and better. So it's kind of a data race. Anyway, that's an aside. The other thing to consider is if your company has already moved to Amazon and you host all your data on Amazon, you host other apps on data on Amazon, then it makes a lot of sense to host your chatbot on Amazon as well because they're very easy to integrate with their other services. Yeah, and kind of related to that is you need to decide how your bot is going to integrate with the rest of your company. So, you know, the chatbot, remember, it's going to have to look up some things in a database or maybe update a database here and there. Um, for example, checking stock, making a reservation, fetching the price of something, whatever the chatbot's doing. It needs to interact with the rest of your company. So you've got to figure out how that happens. This is more of an IT and data architecture decision. Um, and again, so if you're using if you're using AWS for everything, this is a, this is an easy problem to solve. Um, one tricky part is, you know, if, if you want the user to use the bot to do sensitive things like make payments or access private data like their account balance. Um, you're going to have to manage authentication. You're going to have to, you know, ensure the user is who they say they are before you let them, you know, willy-nilly move all their money. So you have to think about that. Uh, so that's kind of an IT security issue. It can be done. You just need to do it carefully. At this point, you can actually start designing the intents and the frames and the question flow. So, you know, now that you have a high-level list of what you want the user to be able to do, you start defining, defining the intents, like find a restaurant, book flight, reset password, whatever it is. And again, for each intent, we want to define the frames. And the frames is just a list of entities that, you, that the bot needs to know to answer the question. And then you need to provide a bunch of training utterances for each intent. For example, for find restaurant, it, some ones that come off the top of my head are, where can I eat around here? I'm hungry. What restaurants are around? Please show me restaurants. Please help me make a reservation. I want a reservation. You know, you can imagine how many different ways there are to say basically the same thing. So the more training utterances you give it, uh, the better it will be able to understand your users. And then, you know, just like with any system that you deploy to users, you want to do continuous imp improvement. 
So you want to, you know, periodically assess how often and when your agent is making mistakes. You know, when it, when the user is not satisfied with with the with the bot. And normally, the way to fix mistakes is to add new training data, because usually what happened is if if your bot didn't understand the user. Um, well, there's two classes. If your bot didn't understand your user, it's, it could be that the user is asking for something the bot can't do. For example, your user says, I want to reset my password, but you never defined that intent. Well, if you, uh, the way to fix that is to add an intent for show password or reset password. On the other hand, the bot might not understand the user because the user um, the user is asking for something the bot can do, but in a new way in a way that the bot has never seen before. So in this case, you need to add more training data to teach the bot, oh yeah, this is a new way to ask for the same thing. So the more you do this, you know, the more you maintain your bot, the better it'll get over time. All right, let's talk about some of the benefits and use cases of chatbots. So first, here's some use cases, some example use cases. Um, so Wells Fargo has a chatbot, called, they call it the banking assistant. This is offered through Facebook, and it allows users to get their balance, show recent transactions, uh, answer questions like, how much money did I spend on food last month? Um, so this works really well. This was the first large US bank to offer a chatbot. Amtrak has one called Julie, and it's offered on their website, Amtrak.com, and it allows you to do all kinds of stuff like make a reservation, plan a vacation, access the FAQ, um, you get your rewards points balance, tell you, show you what stations are available, things like that. Uh, Amtrak said that they got an 8x ROI on their chatbot investment and that about 5 million requests are answered per year with their chatbot. So you can see how this saves their, their agents an incredible amount of time. Sephora launched one called the Sephora Virtual Assistant and they've put it on Kick and on Facebook. And basically this allows people to get tips and tutorials, to get product info and reviews, to make reservations for their stylist. It even lets them upload a photo um, and try to, the, the bot will find matching makeup products. And Sephora says this works really well. And on average, they get about 10 messages per day from per user to their chat bot. So it shows that uh, users are highly engaged. Like I already mentioned, another example is Pizza Hut. It doesn't have a cool name or anything, but they've launched it on Facebook and on SMS, I think. This allows uh, users to place orders and to find out what promotions are available. Pizza Hut says that 50% of their orders are going online, and a lot of those are shifting very quickly to the bot, as opposed to the click and point interface. Domino's has an interesting one. They call it Dom Juan. This is on Tinder, the dating app. And what this does, it, do, it doesn't let users order pizza, but what it does is it helps users come up with cheesy one-liners to make an introduction. And so this was this is more for fun. Uh, it's it's kind of an interesting marketing idea. You know, it's it's helping users solve a problem and at the same time keeping Domino's pizza, you know, on top of mind. Walt Disney also has kind of an unusual chatbot. So they launched a chatbot to, uh, to launch the Zootopia movie a few years ago. So what, what this is, it, it's a chatbot interface, but it's used to play a game. So you, you log in, and the chatbot will ask you questions, and it, you're kind of role-playing. You're, you're a detective, and it'll say, you know, you're chasing a bad guy. Do you want to go left or do you want to go right? And you'll type in left, and you know the chatbot will tell you what happens next. So really, it's just playing a game through a, a chatbot interface. So this was an interesting uh, kind of marketing idea to gamify the advertising experience. Um, so overall, top-level benefits for the company is the big one is cost savings. So if you have your chatbots handling users, then you do, you don't have to have humans doing the same thing. They're also very scalable. So, you know, as your company is growing from 10 users to 10,000 users, the same bot can handle all of these requests simultaneously, where that's impossible for a human. Chatbots are always available. So, 
you know, they don't sleep, they don't eat, they don't take breaks. They, you know, users at any time zone at any time of day can can interact with it. And then kind of a hidden gem is is if you're using a chatbot, you can analyze the chat logs of the users and try to get insights about what are common questions they're asking, what times are they asking, who's asking for what. And you can do the same thing with your call center data uh, by doing speech to text first, um, but it's just a little bit easier with chatbots. And then from a user's, uh, from a customer's point of view, there's a lot of benefits. But, and the biggest one is most people find chatbots to be very intuitive because you're, you're just using natural language, just like you talk to your mom and your, your spouse. People find it very convenient. You can talk with the chatbot while you're in a meeting, while you're on the elevator, while you're doing something else, whenever you want. Um, and while, so you don't have to stop everything, make a call, and wait on hold for 30 minutes. Um, they're always available, so you know you get that nagging question 2 a.m. You can just wake up and solve the problem with the chatbot. Um, yeah, it, it, chatbot or virtual assistants like Google Home give users the ability to, you know, increase their computation powers mentally. For example, like I mentioned earlier, you can say how many t tablespoons in a liter. So it feels like you have this superpower computer in your head. Same thing with enhanced memory. Uh, humans don't have to remember everything now. If you can just ask the bot, uh, who has the answer always, um, it kind of reduces your cognitive load. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, we'll leave that for another lecture. Uh, there was a study by um, the World of Chatbots. They released a report called 2018 State of Chatbots Report. And they came up with the top reasons people say they would use a chatbot. And so here are the results. Interestingly, most people say they would want to use a chatbot to get a quick answer in an emergency. So like I said, rather than call and wait on hold and explain the situation to a human and get passed around, maybe a chatbot is the quickest way to get a, a quick answer. People say they want to resolve a complaint or problem, get detailed answers, make reservations, pay a bill, find a basic item, things like that. Okay, so those are the benefits. Let's talk about some of the challenges. The first challenge is creating that training data for the chatbot can be really hard and expensive. Basically, for every intent, you need hundreds or thousands of possible ways to ask the question. And so you just have to pay a human to sit down, write them all down, and label them. There's really no other way to do it. Another challenge, and this is the one that trips up a lot of, of managers, is they're afraid that if, if your bot is bad, if it misunderstands your user, if it gets everything wrong, you know, if it screws up, then this is going to create a very frustrating experience for your customer, obviously, and that could lead to a loss of a sale or potentially a loss of an entire customer. And so it's a risk. You know, we, you get all the benefits of a chatbot, but if things do go wrong, then you could lose uh, tremendously. And then uh, a a third challenge is, you know, if you let your users create your training data for you, as a couple companies famously did recently, then things can go haywire in an instant. So an example of this is Microsoft created a chatbot. They called they called the chatbot Tay, and they the training data for Tay came from Twitter. And here are some examples of what Tay started to tweet. Hitler did nothing wrong. We're going to build a wall, and Mexico is going to pay for it. So, uh, you know, political stances aside, I'm sure Microsoft did not intend Tay to tweet these things. And basically, if, if you let a chatbot learn from Twitter, you're going to learn very quickly that Twitter can be a dark, deep, scary place. And your chatbot is going to, your chatbot has no way to know whether these are good things to say or bad things to say. It just knows that people say these kind of things a lot, and therefore it must be appropriate. Anyway, so um, as a summary, so today we're talking about chatbots. These are programs designed to simulate a conversation with a human. Uh, there's two main types of chatbots. Conversational agents, these are for long, open-ended conversations about anything at all. 
we didn't talk about these today. Task-oriented agents are for short, very specific tasks. Uh, these, are, these are what we did talk about today. These are um, much more interesting for businesses. Uh, the, these are basically based on defining frames with entities in the frames. Humans have to create labeled training data, and then you use machine learning classifiers to classify utterances into those intents and entity values. The benefits, there's lots of benefits for the customer, mostly convenience and availability and the intuitive interface. And to the company, it's all about cost savings and scaling up and, and providing uh, availability for the customers. So, so hopefully that gives you an overview of chatbots. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge active world, and like I said earlier, it's the pinnacle of NLP. So there's a lot of things we did not cover today. Uh, most notably is exactly how those classifier algorithms are working internally. Like how does a decision tree work? How, does the, how do these deep neural networks classify the intents? We also didn't talk about how to evaluate a chatbot's accuracy. So, you know, we, at some point you need to know is the chatbot working or not, and there are a lot of ways to assess that. We didn't cover that today. And also we didn't, we didn't cover how to build conversational agents, uh, which is an interesting problem, but uh, we were focusing on task-based today. So with that, um, I, I will start taking a few questions. So let's see, um, I have a few already. First question, not related to chatbots. Why would someone take MMA versus MMAI? Good question. Uh, the MMA program, is, it's our bigger program, it, and it covers a kind of a broad, uh, broad curriculum where you learn lots of different analytical techniques, like big data, pricing, operations, predictive. There is AI covered in MMA, but there's also a lot of other things covered as well. MMAI, it's similar to the MMA, and in fact, they share seven courses, but it's more focused. It, we dive deeper into AI, like natural language processing, deep learning, reinforcement learning, that kind of stuff, at the expense of some of the other analytical analytics techniques. So it's kind of one's a one's a broader, higher coverage, one's deeper, less coverage. So pros and cons. It kind of depends on what you where you're starting from and where you want to go. If you have more questions on that, feel free to contact me offline. Okay, next question. What are the advantages of choosing a classifier or rule-based versus shallow ML or deep ML for a chatbot? Good question. Um, so a rule-based, um, these can be very, very precise. Uh, rule-based is basically where a human, like me, we write a program that says, if the user says, what time is it, then reply with, you know, so on. So you can be sure that you can have full control over what the classifier is doing. The downside of rule-based is it's hard to write if-then statements for every possible thing that the, the user could say, because there's so many different ways to ask to see the weather, for example. Shallow machine learning and deep machine learning, that's a great question. Um, and it, it's kind of a, it's a trade-off. Shallow machine learning models are easier to train, faster to train, and you can usually interpret why they made the decision that they did. Deep learning models are, they take longer to train, they need a lot more training data, and you have no idea why they're making the predictions that they are, but they usually make more accurate predictions. So if you want accuracy at the expense of everything else, and you have a lot of training data and a lot of compute power, deep learning is better. But if you have less training data, or you want to understand the predictions, or you don't have a lot of compute power, then a shallow machine learning model is a good choice. Okay, next question. Next question is coming. Here we go. Are there chatbots that provide functionality within programs like Excel? Ooh, good question. Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, although, 
Although, let me let me take that back. I just saw. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. It's either Tableau or Alteryx, so one of these kind of analytics frameworks that just launched a a chatbot-like interface where non-technical users can say things like, what were my sales in Ontario last March? And it will translate that into the appropriate SQL query and answer the question for you. Or you could say, "What are, who are my top three customers? You know, things like that. So this is a very recent. I just saw uh, an announcement on one of my blogs about this. I apologize that I don't remember the product. Um, as far as I know, there's nothing in Excel, although if I were Microsoft, this would be a, 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 a ripe opportunity that I would look at because there's so many Excel users and it would be low-hanging fruit to, to let people ask basic questions about their data. So it's a good idea. It, we're starting to see it in some more advanced tools, but not everywhere yet. Okay, next question. Long one. In terms of task-oriented chatbots, how much is uh, how much is it viable to recognize the real-time user's context, such as user mood or companionship in NLP engine, rather than requesting it from services such as seniors? Okay, I think the question is saying, can we get real-time user context from the text itself, such as their mood, things like that. That's a great idea. And the, the short answer is yes, you can. Uh, but it is harder. It's harder to do. But you, um, I have seen some chatbots, some chatbot tools, that in addition to telling you the intent, it will also tell you the user's mood, their uh, emotional, emotional state, I should say, and there's usually about eight emotional states, angry, mad, or angry, happy, confused, you know, things like that. I forget the exact date. It could also tell you their overall sentiment, happy or sad. Um, so yeah, there are, there are uh, additional, additional tools that you can put into the natural language understanding box to give you some of this context. And that could help you uh, respond to the user in a better way. For example, if, if a chatbot detects that a user is very, very angry, maybe you should um, pass this user off to a human, to your, you know, your, your top sales agent who can calm this person down. Okay, next question. Is the $8 billion in savings by 2022 from staff reductions or improved efficiencies? Good question. Both. I would say both, a little bit of A, a little bit of B. So certainly some companies are looking to cut staff from their call centers. So a lot of savings from that. But other companies are looking to you know, improve the customer experience and therefore you know, keep those customers longer, uh, decrease the chance that they go off to another company. Or you know, some chatbots help the sales process so it helps people shop and make recommendations. So it actually uh, do net new sales that they, they wouldn't have gotten otherwise by waiting on hold to talk to a human. So it's a little bit of both. Uh, this depends on the goal of the, of the organization. And a lot of organizations, I think, have room for both. You know, definitely some staff can be cut from the call center. And that doesn't mean necessarily that these people will lose their jobs. They can just be repurposed to another a higher value add of the of the company. Okay, next question. Are there hybrid chatbots combining machine and human to provide a more accurate service? Hmm. I think what you mean is, well, if I, if I understand the correct the answer uh, the question correctly, I think the answer is yes. So a lot of companies will have kind of their first layer of defense being the chatbot. And if the chatbot can't classify the intent very accurately, or basically if the chatbot can't understand the user, it will immediately go uh, switch, the, switch the customer to a human. 
Um, that way the chatbot do chat bot doesn't just flail around and get everything wrong and frustrate the user. So basically, chatbot first. If the chatbot can help the user, great. If it can't, then you go right to a human. That's a, that's a very good model, very common model. I wouldn't say very common. Common in some industries. Uh, and I think it's a use, if you have the resources to you know, keep some staff around, uh, it's, a good, it's a good hybrid. Okay, next question. Labeling data to train machine learning classifiers for identifying entities makes sense, but how do you count for sentence structures? For example, to from and from to. Yeah, exactly. That, that, great question. That is why you need so many labeled training data. That's why you need, that's why you don't need just five or six. That's why you need 5,000, 50,000, 5 million, because English is so complex. All languages are very complex, and humans are creative, and there's so many different ways to say the same thing. And so the computer needs to just see a lot of examples. You know, when I have three kids, three young kids, and I've kind of taught them all language, not by myself, but been a, uh, I basically watch them learn language. And that's what we do as parents, is we give them lots of training examples. And at first, you know, for the first couple of years, they're, they don't know how to talk. They're still gathering training data. But eventually, they learn. Um, it's similar to a computer. We, it doesn't know anything at first, but the more training data we give it, the more it'll be able to account for you know, to, whether someone says to from or from to. Okay. Uh, one more. No, we have a couple more questions. What would be a good starting point if you'd like to learn how to build your own chatbot? Great question. Um, a really good starting point is to go onto Google's Dialogflow tool. It's called Dialogflow. It's a free tool to let you build a chatbot. Um, it's cloud-based, no programming involved. All you have to do is define the intents the frames, and for each intent, give it as many utter, uh, example utterances as you can. It will automatically label it for you, which is pretty nice. And then when you click Run, it automatically kind of launches this little chatbot, um, this little text interface tool that you can, you can try it out and see how well it works. So that's a really easy way to do it, dialogue flow. Completely free, lots of fun. You can show it to your friends and family, coworkers, kind of prot prototype it out. A lot of tutorials on dialogue flow as well. And it makes the easy things easy, but you can all basically do almost anything. Uh, other than that, if you're a Python programmer, I would check, check out the Chatterbot package, which is similar in spirit, where you basically just give it a bunch of intents and frames, and it goes, you know, it helps you from there. Um, yeah, so try those two out, I would say. Okay, next question. When you train the chatbot agent with input data, how do you define the quality of the output it produces and know if the keywords it extracted are indeed the right fit for the intent and the agent? Okay, so yeah, you're basically asking how do we assess the quality of the chatbot machine learning algorithm. So two answers. You can assess it before you deploy because basically what, what you do is um, you train it on, say, 80% of your training data, and you save 20% of your training data as a test. Um, then for that 20%, you know, so after your, your machine learning algorithm does all its learning and builds its model and stuff like that, then you use the remaining 20% of your data, and you give it to the chatbot, without the right answer, and you see what the chatbot said the intent was. And you compare that to what the human said the intent was, and you compare. And this will give you a sense of, okay, the chatbot is getting about 90% you know, of these correct. And so since you know what the answer is, you can you know, measure that concretely. So that, that works really well, and that's what people do before you deploy it. After you deploy, things get harder. 
because now you have humans asking questions that you've never heard before, and your chatbot is giving answers that you've never seen before. So basically what people do here is you, you save a log of all the transcripts of all the interactions between the chatbot and the user. And periodically, you know, as your time and budget allows, you just manually go back and assess how often, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how often your chatbot was right. So you see what the chatbot classified the intent is. You as a human, you say, well, yeah, the human was looking for restaurants, so you got this one right. So if you do this a couple hundred times, you can say, you know, with some statistical confidence that, you know, our chatbot's working 96% of the time, or whatever the answer is. That's one way. Another way to evaluate a live chatbot scenario is, well, remember a few questions ago we were talking about the hybrid chatbot, where if the chatbot doesn't know, then it gets passed off to a human. So you can just measure how, how many times are we passing off to a human. If the chatbot, chatbot is never getting passed off to a human, and the customer is never asking to be transferred to a human, then that's a sign that the, the chatbot is working well. You can also measure the length of the chatbot session. So if the, sh the session is very short and the customer didn't ask to talk to a human, then that's a sign that the customer got what they wanted, did what they needed to do, and then got out of there. So those kind of things help as well. Good question. Um, would the order of words in a sentence matter while training since each word will have a value like one or zero? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Depends on which kind of machine learning classifier that we're using. Some of the shallow machine learning models actually don't even use word order at all. So it doesn't matter what the order is. Uh, but the some of the deep machine learning models like RNNs and LSTMs, they keep the words in the specific order, so the order, the sentence order is very important. So this is why, again, um, you need so much training data, because you need to basically think of every possible way to book a restaurant, so that the uh, the machine learning algorithm will learn every possible way that the human might do it. Okay, I think we have time for, let's do, let's do one more question. Uh, let's go with, how well do chatbots handle non-native speakers? For example, accents or incorrect words, syntax, people with speech disabilities? Good question. Um, <clears throat> This again comes down back down to training data. Uh, well, I guess there's there's two ways to handle. There's two ways to handle. For example, let's take a simple case of misspelling a word. So, say your user misspells the word restaurant. If you want your chatbot to be able to handle that situation, you need to do one of two things. One is you have training data where restaurant is misspelled. So if you're, that's, again, this is why we need so much, so much training data, because we need to now account for every word and every sentence could possibly be, mis be misspelled in many, many different ways. Or perhaps an easier way to do it is um, before you actually give the utterance to the classifier, you run a spell checker on, on the utterance. And it will look through each word one by one. If it sees a misspelled one, It'll run another algorithm, another natural language processing algorithm, to try to figure out what the user meant. Sometimes it's easy to figure out what word they meant. Sometimes it's not as easy, but it, try their best before they give it on to the chatbot. In terms of um, you know the speech part, you know it, if the user is interacting not through uh, typed text but instead through their voice, yes, this this is a whole other ball of wax. This is a, and, and I kind of glossed over this in the slides, but the, there'll be a first step that goes from audio to text. So it takes the audio waves of somebody's voice, and this is another classifier, 
that will classify that audio wave into a sequence of words. This classifier itself needs all kinds of training data. So you get a bunch of humans to talk, uh, say some words out loud, and then you tell the classifier, this is what Steve just said. And so it learns you know, that this sound means this word. So if you know that you need to handle non-native speakers with accents, then you need a lot of training data with those accents. Otherwise, the classifier won't be able to recognize it very well. You know, in fact, we, we at Smith, we're doing a project with um, a big company in Toronto analyzing their call center data. And this is exactly the problem we're running into right now is because this company is saving the audio of all the calls, which is good, but a lot of their customers have these wild accents. I mean, thousands of different accents. Some of them talk really fast. There's background noise. They use slang. Uh, there's a lot of ums. There's kids in the background. And all of this makes it really, really, really hard for the, the audio to, to text component. So it tries its best, but it gets you know one out of every five, one out of every 10 words just wrong. So you try to kind of account for that after the fact with spell checkers and other natural language processing techniques, but it's still not perfect, unfortunately. So this is why chatbots aren't perfect yet, because of all of these problems. Anyway, um, that's it for time today. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for sitting in on this webinar, and thank you for those great questions. Um, feel free to follow up with me about, uh, if you're interested in this area, about chatbots or about the programs in general. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day.